Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. Today I wanted to kind of just do a nice, honest, deep dive into my entire life as a cardiology fellow, now going into year two. The last time I kind of gave one of these updates was the end of my first year where I was really just going over what my schedule would look like. Now that I am past the behemoth that is the first year of cardiology fellowship, a lot has changed in my life for the better, including my schedule. And so today's video is really going to be a very honest, off the cusp, unscripted concept where I go over life as a cardiology fellow, what my schedule really looks like, how much I'm on call, what my work-life balance and satisfaction has been like, as well as the important things like, what am I gonna be doing with my future career? Do I know what direction I'm gonna be going into? Cause I'm a year and a half away at this point from making that big decision of what job I want to ultimately pick as my first big boy cardiology job. And so hopefully this video is helpful for those you guys are interested, for those who want the very typical study tips, productivity, etc., medical school journey, success tips, there'll be more videos coming out in the future. But if you enjoy this honest kind of tick back and just want to listen or enlisting in the form of a podcast, then hopefully this helps. Now, the first thing that I want to break down is really just kind of go over what my schedule has been like, what rotations I've done over the past kind of five or six months. And so let's get into that. So this is kind of a screenshot of the schedule of all the fellows or a few of the fellows just to give you an idea of the variety of rotations that you can do when you're a cardiology fellow. And this right here, smack in the middle, is my kind of rotation schedule. And so as you can see, you can be on rotations like electrophysiology for a month and do a month of ICU in the cardiology ICU. As you can see, I have a lot of green, which is a lot of imaging months. And then I have more months where I do things like consults. And if you compare this to my co-fellows who may do the same rotations just at different times of the year, as well as different kind of distributions of rotations. So if you're interested in electrophysiology, you may be doing tons more of those compared to me, or if you're interested in cath, you may be doing more of those. And so just going over the rotations that I've done so far this year. So I had a month of consults, which is kind of cut off from this picture, a month of electrophysiology, tough month of ICU after just doing it at the very end of my first year. So it was like really stacked well together. And then I'm currently in this phase where I've been just finishing a month of advanced echo, which I'll get into. I'm currently in my new research block and slash vacation, which I actually go on today. And then I have a few more months of imaging with a month of cath in between before I transition to the next semester. And so this is kind of what my schedule looks like. This is a four week kind of block where every four weeks or every month, more or less, we rotate to a different rotation where our whole job is to get better at that entity of cardiology. So that way when I'm done with my fellowship, I'll ideally be well-versed because I've done each of these a significant amount of time. So that's what my schedule looks like. And I shared this in that past video. If you're interested in more details, you know, I'll kind of link down video down below. But what is my hourly kind of schedule look like on a day-to-day -day basis. As a second year fellow, a lot nicer than a first year, mainly not because I'm showing up later or I'm leaving earlier, but primarily because I do less, more abrasive calls. So where I do my fellowship, and it depends on every institution is different. I do 24 hour in-house calls, which means that once a week when I'm on call, I'm manning the ICU and any other cardiology kind of emergencies, but I'm staying in the hospital to do so. But I do it once a week. And so I do my morning rotation, let's say I'm on my cath rotation, I do that, stay over overnight and then manage the ICU and all emergencies. And the next morning I go home with the rest of that day off. It may sound brutal. I was used to doing 28 hour calls when I was a resident. So this is actually a little bit easier. And the fact that you can have the potential of sleeping if the night's relatively quiet and then going home and having a day off is actually really nice. Compared to other places that do fellowships, they may do something where you do in-house call. So you take phone calls from home, which sounds nice. But if you have a brutal night or if you have to go into the hospital because a patient is sick enough, which happens pretty frequently in cardiology, you still have to go in to your next day's rotation. And so that is where like the caveat of, I'm not sure if I would want that kind of schedule. So for me, this call schedule works really nicely because if I'm on a rotation where I don't have to work Saturdays and Sundays, and that ends up being a good amount of them. And on top of that, if I have a really good call night where I get some sleep, then I may have a Thursday post call day where I have the entire day off. I've got enough rest the night before I can enjoy it with my daughter and my wife. And then I also have Saturday and Sunday to do the same. So I almost can have three days off to enjoy with my family, which is really nice for work-life balance. In addition, when I was a first year, we'd be doing calls going into the weekends, which would kind of go into your freedom time. So you may be on Friday into Saturday. And then if you didn't sleep well on Friday night, then you may be using the majority of your Saturday to recover. So you really have like one day off for a week. Those are less frequent for me as a second year. And I only do like three or four of them compared to doing like 12 of them as a first year. So I'm doing less abrasive calls. And so that's really the biggest shift is I'm doing less of those nasty call days. And I'm having more call days on a Tuesday going into a Wednesday with Saturday and Sundays off. So that's really nice. 
nice. And the second nice part about second year so far has it been elective time. So I have two months compared to zero as a first year where I get to control what I do during that month. I have to tell them ahead of time, like I wanna do research this month or I wanna do more imaging or whatever it may be. And during that month, I have weekends protected. And if I'm doing anything that requires me to work from home primarily, then I don't necessarily have to go into the hospital if there's no clinical duties aside from call days. And so for reference, this past week, I started my first of two elective months where I've decided that every single week I'm gonna do something different. This past week, I was reading stress test because I wanted to. And this coming week, I'm on my first week of four of vacations for the year. The week after, I'm doing an intensive CT kind of program to get a lot of CT exposures as a cardiologist. And the last week, I'm gonna do some research so that I just get a bunch of projects off my plate, increases my bandwidth going to the future. So that's really nice. And then I have all my weekends off to do things like hang out with family. Right now, we're kind of approaching October, November. And so that affords me a ton of time, both during the week as well as the weekends to enjoy with my family, to do things like moonlighting. Currently, we're in October, November is the filming of this video. And so this in the Indian community is also a really busy time because it's the festival of Diwali, the festival of lights and New Year's and the Hindu and Indian calendar. And so really big festivals and celebrations going on. So it's really nice just being around family instead of being like on an IC rotation. And that gets me into the second part of the video that I want to talk about, which is work-life balance. As a first year, I don't think my work-life balance was bad, but then looking at what my life looks like now as a second year, it's a lot better. And a lot of it is because I'm no longer on those abrasive calls. Number two is because I feel so much more comfortable in cardiology as a cardiology fellow. And I'll get into kind of what my comfort and my future goals are going to be like. And so it allows me the ability to finish my work a lot sooner, to move things off my plate in terms of clinical duties a lot quicker, potentially afford myself the ability to get to the hospital 30 minutes later because I can see the same amount of patients a lot faster, more efficiently, more effectively than when I was a first year, just trying to understand what I needed to know. And I would be getting to the hospital significantly early, sacrificing sleep or just going to bed early. But that would often kind of play into taking time away from my, at that time, just baby daughter who was just born or time away from my wife. And so now just being more efficient, being more comfortable as a cardiology fellow allows me the ability to go into the hospital at 8.30 or eight o'clock in the morning instead of like 6.45, because I no longer need that extra 45 minutes or 90 minutes to look up all the patients. I kind of know the drill of what to look for, what patterns um, that are gonna matter to effectively take care of patients. The second part that's really nice is because I know my career is heading to more towards a general non-invasive aspect of cardiology instead of doing things like stents or electrophysiology procedures, that affords me the ability to do more rotations in imaging as you kind of saw from my schedule. And thus that means I usually have my weekends off. And two, imaging is usually depending on how fast you are. So if I'm quicker at reading echoes, then again, I can do them a little bit more efficiently and thus have more free time for my family. If I'm in a situation where I need to go to an appointment or for other day we had somebody come to the house to do some maintenance work and so I can read echoes from home and still do my clinical duties, drive into the hospital and then work with my attending for the rest of the day. It allows me that flexibility. I'm not necessarily having to be at a patient's bedside and taking care of them 24 seven. So because a lot of my rotations have transitioned to that because that is what I'm interested in doing for part of my cardiology career, it's also made life a lot easier. And that nicely gets into the third aspect I wanna talk about today's episode, which is where has my happiness level been as a second year cardiology fellow or just as an upperclassman? And I can appreciate how much I've grown within the field of cardiology with just, just in a year. It's natural when you're at another phase of your medical journey, whether you're in med school, going to rotations, med school, just starting things like anatomy, going to a new rotation that's like overwhelming. Surgery was an example of that for me. Starting residency and being a brand new intern and like finally having to play doctor when you're just learning how to figure it out. And cardiology fellowship is no different. Your first, like honestly, six months is you just drinking from the fire hydrant of knowledge that is the field of cardiology and still feeling really inadequate because you don't have enough reps to feel comfortable with really anything. And so constantly as a first year fellow, you're just hoping that you don't encounter a situation that you can't take care of a patient because you don't know what you're doing. And thankfully you have enough safety nets uh, if you're at the right institution to make decisions, but then have the support of people to help you and guide you. But after your first six months, at least for me, because now I was able to do rotations the second and third time and see patients for the fifth or sixth time with a similar presentation, you're able to identify patterns between patients and what meds to give, what labs you would see, what dosings to do. And so then you get away from baby cardiology and start making decisions and then evaluating where did this work? Which patients benefited when I made this decision? Which ones didn't? Which ones did poorly? And that helps you identify your own mental models of how to take care of from everything, how to take care of heart attacks, how to take care of patients with high blood pressure, heart failure, arrhythmias, you name it. And so now as a second year cardiology fellow, like I feel like my 
foundation strong. There are certain areas that I know I'm really good at. There are certain areas that I know I'm not so good at. But that's the benefit of being at this phase of my journey because now I can see the discrepancies of where I'm strong and where I'm weak. And that allows me, uh, affords me the ability of saying, cool, you're not so great at EP Lux. You need to spend more time on that because you don't want to be an attending cardiologist and not know how to read a good EKG. Not that I'm there, but that's just an example. When you're a first year, everything looks like a weakness because it is. And so it's really hard to understand how and what to work on next. And so at every phase of your medical journey, initially you start like this imposter beginner because you are. And as you develop the skills, as you develop the reps, certain things will become more adept. And so the nice thing about being at this phase where I know I have still another year and a half in front of me to improve, to progress, is that I can appreciate the differences between my strength and weaknesses a lot better. I know my foundation's overall very strong, but now I can spend the next year and a half working on the skills that I really want to become adept at and want to be an expert in the field um, that my colleagues look at to a resource instead of just like, here's the new baby cardiologist attending that is joining us. But on the flip side, also working on my weaknesses to make sure that my patients are not at the whim of my weakest link. I would never want my patients to have the misfortune of being taken care of by me. And so that requires me to always be hyper vigilant, to be proactive about all my weak points and really just working on those, whether it's electrophysiology, congenital cardiology, medications, EKGs, echoes, like there are definitely tons of pillars in the field of cardiology and slowly you have to pick on. And so at this phase, it's really exciting because I can identify the places that need the most progress and really know that I have the time to still do that. And the second part of being this phase that's really made me happy and has raised my level of confidence is that I've heard enough comments from my attending that I'm beyond where they would expect me to be. And this is not tooting my own horn, but I'm happy that I put in the work my first 12, 18 months to be at a stage where my attendings would say, you're, you're performing at almost an independent third year level or beyond a third year fellows level. And so again, knowing that I have time left, but I'm performing beyond what other people are expecting of me, hoping that they're not just all blowing smoke up my rear end and really understanding that I will keep myself accountable to constantly improve. Think about any aspect of your medical journey where you felt, man, I'm finally getting this. And often we don't get to appreciate that moment enough because you're always transitioning to the next phase where you're just super uncomfortable, but enjoy that aspect when you get to it. I'm there right now and I'm gonna try to cherish this moment as much as possible. I'm gonna try to make the most of it because I know that there are still elements that I'm not great at and I want to be. And so hopefully by the time I'm a, I'm a third year fellow and I'm making this video again in a year, I'll be able to say that with true certainty that I'm getting really close to my job and I know that I'll be ready for independent practice. But it's an exciting phase. Again, happiness is increased, my confidence is increased, and that luxury of time that is still left in training, for me, it's likely gonna be the last time I'm gonna be in a training kind of environment. And for the rest of my life, I'll be officially in attending. I'm gonna cherish these last year and a half so it's truly for what they are. For the rest of the episode, I'm gonna talk about two things. One is going to be about my future career plans, like really what I wanna do in the field of cardiology. And two, I'm gonna talk about things outside of being a cardiology fellow that are important to me, especially being a dad to my now one-year-old daughter and then just being a very present husband and family member. But before we get into the rest of the episode, today's episode has been brought to you by our very own Med School Blueprint. If you are on your medical journey, for the past seven, eight years, I've lost count now, I have made tons and tons of resources on how to navigate every phase, whether it's how to study better, how to be more productive, how to be more motivated, how to do better on your rotations, your board exams, get into residency, step three, you name it. And so instead of having tons of programs that you can have options of doing, we've just decided to put them all in one place for you to go ahead and explore and get the benefit of now, as well as when you're at those future phases in your journey. And so if you're constantly frustrated of having to look for new pieces of advice and true pieces of strategies instead of just the superficial stuff at every phase of your journey, then definitely consider checking out the Med School Blueprint. It's been tried and tested by hundreds of students over the past few years. The testimonials and reviews speak for themselves. I'll link down below. And personally, in medical school, I wish early on I had some kind of resource where somebody would tell me, here's what I wish I did, here's what I wish I didn't. And so I've taken the liberty of taking all my successes and failures, put them into one place, brought them up to the strategies that I wish somebody would have told me on my first day of medical school and included them all for you guys in the med school blueprint. And so if you're interested in learning one, what's included, and two, more importantly, the results and feedback students have gotten using the program, go ahead and check out the link down below to learn more about the med school blueprint. So now for the last part of this episode, I really want to talk about future career, future life, and then personal life. And so the first aspect is what do I want to do now in the field of cardiology? And I've alluded to this during this video, honestly, but I've also alluded to this in prior videos. I know I don't want to be an interventional cardiologist being called at 3 a.m. to come put a stent in. I know I don't want to be an electrophysiology doctor looking at fancy EKGs and EGMs of people's heart rhythms and putting in pacemakers and doing ablations, all cool and fancy, not my cup of tea or coffee. But I know I enjoy being at the bedside. I know I've learned to develop this love 
for imaging where I can take something like, for example, somebody's echo and tell an entire story of what that patient may have. Looking at their echo and saying they're probably short of breath pretty often, or they may have an arrhythmia for several years, or this patient looked like they've had uncontrolled high blood pressure for decades. This person probably can't lay flat when they sleep at night. But then, unlike a radiologist that can tell the story, I can use their cardiac images and actually take care of the patient at bedside or in clinic and then watch their progress through medication management, through lifestyle interventions. So that's the cool part. And so I'm going to be what we call a non-invasive cardiologist, which means I just don't do those procedures that interventionalists or electrophysiology doctors do. And I am likely going to be a general cardiologist with a high focus on advanced imaging. And so one of the aspects we haven't talked about is I told my program that I was interested in getting as much imaging exposure as possible. And in cardiology, we have levels. And basically there's level one through three, COCATs one through three. Three basically means that in that field, in that entity, in that pillar, you have enough experience and training to be a director of whatever that is. For example, if you say you're level three in echo, you have the potential of running an echo lab. If you're level three in nuke and stress exams, same thing, you can run a lab or a center in that entity. If you're level three in cath, then you're likely an interventional cardiologist has done enough procedures and you can run a cath lab. And so during your cardiology training, everybody tends to get the same threshold of minimum experience. I will be like level one, maybe level two in cath, but that's not something I intend to do. But I want to be level three and as much of those imaging modalities as possible. And so my program has basically created this brand new imaging track that allows me to do more imaging months and rotations to really be able to get the numbers to be able to hit that level, which is nice. And so I know that when I graduate, I will be an advanced imager plus general cardiologist. I'll have all the abilities of seeing patients as a consultant in the clinics and taking really good care of them, but I'll have an advanced kind of grasp of imaging just because I've had tons more reps, probably anywhere from four to five X when my co-colleagues and co-fellows have gotten at this phase. And so that's really nice because I will have something to help sell myself to future employers saying, I'm really good at this within three years of fellowship. And you don't have anyone that can currently do a B and C. I can fill that hole for you. I can take care of your patients better because of these. And so that's what my future plan is going to be. Over the next year and a half, I'm going to be doing a lot more months of imaging, a lot more months of consults and general cardiology. And the hope is, is that that is going to be a nice selling point when it's time for me to broadcast myself to the market of looking for a job of have level threes and these imaging modalities. I have this much experience, be able to run one of your echo labs, for example, if that is a need that they have. But I'm also a great general cardiologist based off of these experiences. And I think that's going to give me the most variety that I'll be happy with when I'm an attending. I'll have abilities where I'll have half days where I'm potentially just reading echoes. That's all I'm doing. I'll have half days where I'm seeing patients in clinic or a week at a time where I may be seeing patients in the hospital. And that variety is nice, is that I'm not doing the same thing over and over again, which is one of the biggest reasons I left the hospital's medicine after working for a year, is I realized after like three months of the job that I was getting paid well, my lifestyle was great, but I was bored out of my mind. And so this variety and constant challenge of cardiology, but also having tons of entities that I can be really great at and being an asset to my patients, an asset to my colleagues who need help. You know, not all cardiologists are perfectly comfortable reading a complex echo. And so if you are really good at reading complicated echoes, then you will have colleagues that say, you know what, maybe I'm just really good at putting stents in or taking care of patients with cardiovascular disease and blockages and CAD, but I don't want to read all my patients' echoes. It makes actually more sense for me to send my echoes to Lux over here who can read my complicated echoes. And instead of me spending a bunch of my time reading those echoes that are tougher for me, I can do my interventions and do my procedures. And so that's a common kind of relationship that people create in the field of cardiology. You don't have to do everything. If you feel like one of your colleagues is better at taking care of your patients through one modality, you can send them their images, their stress tests or EKGs to look at, and you can focus on the main aspects of cardiology that you are good at. In the same way that I'm not going to be doing stents for my patients, I'll be sending them to one of my colleagues. Ideally, I can become that resource to my group, to my patients. And so really the next year and a half of my cardiology fellowship is becoming really, really, really good at imaging, becoming really, really, really good at general cardiology and becoming an asset to whichever future employer I have the potential of joining. And so the last aside to that future plan is sometimes people will ask me, do I consider the potential of doing advanced fellowship? So even in cardiology, after you've spent like 12, 14 years and after graduating college doing this path, there are other ex extra years of training you can do if you want to be an interventionalist, you want to be an extra physiologist, and even within imaging, you can spend an extra year or two doing things 
things like MRI or CT. And so people often ask me, Laksh, do you want to do the same? And the honest answer is I just don't know. I could perfectly see myself at the current time being okay with just being happy with graduating cardiology fellowship, taking the skills that I leave with and just running with them to be able to finally start the life with my family. That is not always me being busy at work, working on a cardiology fellow salary. We're currently a single income household. So that plays a big part of my decision making. And honestly, I think I'd be happy with being a general cardiologist with having these advanced imaging skills that I've developed and will develop. And so that's a big roundabout way of saying right now, I'm unsure, but I won't be against the idea of just finishing this off and not really considering more training further on. Now, the last part of this episode that I really want to hit on that's really the most important to me is what my life has been like now being a dad of a year and a half because I have been a cardiology fellow as long as I've been a dad because my daughter was born two weeks into my cardiology fellowship. And then what my life has been like as all the other roles I play as a husband, as a family member, etc. Because of a lot of the reasons that we talked about of my life being a little bit more flexible, being more available, being more open as a second year fellow, and me being more comfortable in my role as a cardiology fellow, I think my life as those hats that I wear, particularly as a husband and as a dad, have improved. Now, one of the biggest reasons that I think that's also improved is that my daughter has grown up and has become more independent, as, as independent as a one and a half year old can be at this point, but she's walking. She's able to feed herself as long as we can put food in front of her. She occupies her time and play. She's at that fun area where it's, it's fun for dad to come home. It's fun for me to spend time with my daughter, but she is not fully dependent on you to the extent that she was when she's like three month old. We're having to hold her around, having to feed her with a bottle, change her diapers constantly, being woken up multiple times in the middle of the night. Now it's she sleeps through the night. She eats the food that we provide her multiple times in a day. She enjoys playing with her toys. She enjoys hanging out with her family. And it's become more of flexibility for my wife and I to do things like chores around the house or eat or just go take a nap while the other one is keeping an eye on her. And that has been really nice is that I can see my daughter create this really fun, cute personality, enjoy that as a dad and not be so tired of all the other roles that come from being a dad to a newborn that it is to like now a 15 month old. So it's a really exciting aspect of our lives because she's learning so much. He's growing so much in so many beautiful ways and coming home is even more motivating. Like now my daughter can say a few words and having her see say Dada or run towards you as you're coming towards the door. Those like your things that you will constantly remember as life as a parent. And I do not regret our decision of considering having a family, knowing that I had more training in front of me, knowing that it was going to be busy. And it was as a first year. I've made another episode about my life as a brand new dad a year ago, but this is such a fun time. I'm comfortable in my job. I have a great family. My daughter has grown up to a phase where she has some level of independence, even though we're obviously having to be big supervisors, but she can walk around, she can eat, she can sleep, she can play, That's and she's healthy. That's all we can ask as parents. And that's allowed my wife and I to spend more time together, to just enjoy each other's company without the stresses of just wearing that parent hat 24 seven, is that our daughter gives us that flexibility of saying for these 30 minutes, you don't have to worry about being a parent. Just keep an eye on me, I'm gonna play with my toys, you guys enjoy your coffee. And that has afforded us the ability to just enjoy each other's company a lot more. And that's allowed me to be more present in all the roles that I've played. And one of the future videos that'll be coming out soon, I talk about the aspects of how I have done a better job of blocking off my time. I'm no longer obsessed by releasing the next video because if I don't wake up within the hours of four to seven, that is my time to spend for you guys, to spend to my personal goals, to spend on my fitness. But from like 5 p.m. whenever time I'm getting home to like 10, all of the YouTube, all the content creation, all the exercise stuff is not a priority. It's about being a present family figure, being a present husband and dad, and really enforcing that on me without the guilt of missing out on every other opportunity that I may be seeking or trying to approve on has really helped my quality of life. Maybe the views or YouTube videos or Instagram may not be as high as I'm used to, but I'm okay with that. I feel like now I can come to a more present, more authentic version for you guys when I do record a video. Because right now, for example, it's six o'clock, 6.30 as I'm making this and my daughter's asleep. My wife is enjoying her beauty rest as well. And then we're gonna go on a vacation um, across the country in the next two or three hours. And I get to enjoy another few days where I'm fully just focused on being present as a family man. And that is the fun part again about this aspect of being a cardiology fellow where I am comfortable. And I'm happy. And so wherever you are in your journey, if you feel like you're not there because it's brand new and everything is like overwhelming, I promise you, you'll get there. If you're starting off, don't be hard on yourself. Just understand what roles are important to you in your lives. I think that's what's helped me is to really just understand these are the hats that I really care about wearing and mastering and figure out the times of your day, the times of your week where 
each hat is going to be present. And when it's time for you to put family person or cardiology fellow or whatever it may be training, then just be fully present, be fully invested in that time. And you'll get the best of all the worlds that you are trying to balance. So that is enough of me jibber jabbering. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this kind of insight off the cusp, honest insight into my life as a cardiology fellow. If these kinds of episodes are engaging to you guys and you want more, let me know what concepts and questions and topics you want me to hit in future videos and when I do these updates in the comments comment section down below. As always, if you enjoyed this video, two things that I would ask you to do. One, just hitting that like button, subscribe, notification bell, one of the three, just to one, tell me that these videos helped you. Ideally, it gets in front of somebody else that it may help. Two, it tells you when our future videos go out. Definitely consider leaving a comment so I can engage and answer y'all's questions, which I really enjoy doing once I have some time to actually do so. And if you enjoyed this video, then check out this video right here on the study tool that I have now fully converted to away from Monkey, as well as this video right here on my life as a cardiology fellow. And as always, thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video if you did. Hopefully, as a little help to you guys on yours. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.